you have another conflict and some years after post-traumatic stress will kick in. But sometimes that can be 12 years after. You have a change in migration policy, like the borders opening up and East Europeans coming here. Suddenly the whole profile of people on the streets mm -hmm. change. You have a lot of fit people, but they have no rights. So all the statistics about who is on the streets need to be taken with a bit of a pinch of salt. You yeah. know, people have the, as John said, he's got the people who come to the big issue office very much in mind, which is another group of people. So, you know, we have to be careful about any generalisation. As the gentleman said at the back, you can be on the streets and you don't conform to this stereotype of the homeless person on the street, but there are other issues behind it. So I want to, I want to come back to what Alistair said about um, you know, the ways off the street, his fear it's all going to be done by sectioning people. I come back to this sort of this test that's been done over the last 12 months in London. Those 205 people who are identified, they haven't been got off the street, the they, um, you know, three quarters who have, by use of the Mental Health Act. There are some people left who are, everybody thinks probably have some really ingrained mental health issues <coughs> that actually are, are a real danger to them. We know that people died of cold on the streets and they didn't come off in that very, very cold weather we had. And of course, you know, if... It was our son or brother or um, family member. We would want them to be protected, and that's why some of these things exist. So it's got to be used appropriately um, in order that people get the help that they need to be well again. Um, relationships and, and um, you know, the different roles that we can all take. Yes, absolutely. Um, the, there was not one approach that has worked. There has been... What has happened is that people have had fresh conversations and fresh people have had those conversations. One, one area where it's been working really well is in the city where a sort of an older woman in her 50s has sat down, had a different sort of conversation with people who've been out for 10 or 15 or 20 years than perhaps they would have had with a bright, fresh-faced sort of young key worker. And, you know, you have to be where people are and talk about where they want to be. A hostel is definitely not always the answer, not even a bright, fresh one with a recording studio and a gym and all the other things that can be there, <laughs> um, which many of them are now. A lot, of, a lot of capital money has gone in to making hostels completely different. I say, you know, drop the S, don't call them hostels, call them hotels, because that's a whole different offer to people. And in some cases, there's been some fantastic work with the churches where people have said, I'm never going to accept anything from those professionals, been there, done that. And actually, some of the churches have um, been, been paid in order to go and get bed and breakfast, and people have been prepared to go in because they're members of a congregation, and that's great as well. Let's do what will work for people. What really annoys me is where we have somebody who clearly is very ill. We had a guy, I won't say which town he was in but he was sat outside a day center for five days in the cold weather sort of in his own excrement not moving and they managed to get him to take water but not to come in and everybody came from the statutory services the mental health the adult safeguarding panel the so nobody would take responsibility they all said oh no we know him well there's nothing we can do for him they had meetings people spent Hundreds of pounds sat around in these meetings, and this guy was going to die. So he got sent to A&E, because otherwise he would have frozen to death. A&E chucked him out within a couple of hours. And then he got, three times, he got beaten up by the public in the grounds of the hospital that he'd been thrown out of. Now, that's where, actually, people doing their job with the powers that exist to protect people has to be our priority, and we should get angry that it doesn't happen. Thank you. I've got two questions. There's a gentleman at the back that's been waiting, just up there, and then there's a gentleman on the road in front of you. Thank you. And can we still answer the other questions as well? You uh, can, yeah. I didn't see hands waving at Hopeful. Sorry, sorry it's my mistake. Sorry, I thought you were... I'll take these and we'll... I'll, I'll, I'll note it. <coughs> yes. Uh, hey, I just want to ask you to kind of uh, think about your definitions of mental health, because I think... Uh, there are lots of problems and stereotypes when thinking about mental health. It's easy to think of everyone uh, being very schizophrenic or having lots of different personalities. But 
mental health, I think, in most cases, and in the cases that uh, are often most in, uh, uh, really important to deal with and not to forget about, is, is remembering that mental health is, is uh, just what's going on in your brain and uh, what you're thinking and how your uh, circumstances affect that. Um, and so lots of people's mental health can be, it can be shame or it can be uh, having no one uh, to listen to you or um, no one to talk to you. And these are things that often get uh, forgotten about when you're talking about these kind of big, scary mental health conditions. And I'd just like you to, to think about that. Thank Thanks. you very much. Could I have a microphone to stand from here for me? Thank you. And then we'll come take it along the panel. Um, I like football, and uh, I just read uh, Bobby Charlton's biography of growing up. And it, what really struck me, he grew up in real absolute poverty in uh, the northeast. But he emphasises they didn't have enough food to eat a lot of weeks. He emphasises in this biography all the time the strength of his relationships and his identity in that community. And it strikes me that um, those two areas of poverty, as well as obviously material poverty, most homeless people aren't from the richer areas, they're from the poor areas. So material poverty is always going to be an issue. But unless we can understand the poverty of relationship and of identity, I just think all the funding is like a leaky bucket, really. Um, and uh, it's interesting, no one's from the Sally Army here, but I've just seen they've, they're not calling them hostels anymore in the Sally Army, they're calling them life houses. Mm -hmm. And they're really emphasising the issue of, uh, I think it's relationships and purpose. So I think that's quite an interesting challenge. Obviously it's a challenge put into practice, but uh, I think that, that's an interesting one, especially what you say about the name hostel. Mm -hmm. Thank you, that's very interesting. Should we start, Fiona, one second, John. I'm going Fiona, Jeremy, and I'll come down to John. I just wanted to think about this thing about what can be done to help people and sort of link in to the last contribution as well. I mean, the last staff conference we held was the first one where our staff actually talked about the need for love in people's relation in people's lives and how important relationships were. And to me that was quite a, a big step forward because instead of talking about material things or specific <coughs> problems or dealing with substance misuse, suddenly we were talking about things on a, on a different level. And um, I think that's a very positive way forward, and I think that is the way forward in terms of trying to make real advances. I think we can't give up on the things that we've been doing for the last 20 or 30 <coughs> years around trying to get statutory services engaged with those people who are most difficult, who don't fit in the boxes, because we still have the problem of services being led by disciplines, not being so multidisciplinary, not able to cope with people who have personality disorders or, you know, who have specific issues which they think their box doesn't encompass. So I think we still have to do a lot of that. And I think we have to look at some of the things that are happening around building emotional resilience in young people, seeing if some of those lessons can kick in at a later stage, even when people, you know, haven't had that as a young person. So I think there's a lot to be learnt from that and, and to be taken forward. And a lot just around the issue about people and self-esteem, because that issue about mental health, you know, all of us have mental health issues at some point in our lives. Often it's about depression. Depression stultifies you, it stops you changing. And one of the things that people need in order to come off of the streets and to make changes in their lives is, is to be able to mentally free themselves. So, you know, I, I think there's quite a few areas there that a lot of people are looking into and I think it will make big differences for people going forward. Thank you. Um, I think the, the point made in the back <coughs> is important because we're defining mental health too broadly and I think when the guy said there's people on the street who are sane, he's at, of course there are people on the street who are sane. We, we're just taking this label too far and for John to say that everybody therefore needs counselling is again an example of an extreme response. Now the social networks bit is very, very important and certainly I would heartily applaud what we should the, the work we're doing around helping people build up very constructive networks off the streets. I think um, housing justice play a very important part in that, and I think the contribution made by faith groups across London and elsewhere is very, very important. As Alistair knows, I, I, why you still want to come onto the streets and provide soup beats me in 2010, but we may have discussed that one or two times in the past. <laughs> um, just don't get 